Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders about the future of the crypto revolution. My name is Brian Crane. Today we have a really special episode. So I was speaking with Anatoly Yakovenko, the founder and CEO of Solana Labs, um, about Solana. So of course Solana has had an absolutely uh, phenomenal uh you know, phenomenal growth this year has gone up tremendously in market cap and activity. And we recorded this episode at the very first um, big Solana conference breakpoint, which took place in Lisbon. There was over 2000 people there and it was really a very vibrant event. So I'm excited about that conversation and I'm sure you'll enjoy it as well. Now, before we go to the conversation with Anatoly, I want to talk briefly about the sponsors for this week and that's CowSwap. Now, DEXs are great, but they're vulnerable to problems like MEV, we talked about this a little bit in the podcast, failed transactions and high gas costs on Ethereum. CowSwap tackles these issues head on and offers a new kind of trading experience. It's built by Gnosis and CowSwap is a meta DEX aggregator. That's right, it's a DEX aggregator aggregator. Um, it fights MEV by matching overlapping orders directly and if no overlapping orders are found, the trades are settled on a variety of underlying AMMs and it chooses the best price wherever it finds it. So give CowSwap a try and enjoy perks like no gas fees paid on failed transactions, optimized transaction management for multi six and DAOs, and some other fun and entertaining surprises. So head over to cowswap.exchange and start swapping today. And now with that, let's go to our conversation with Anatoly. Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview you know crypto founders and talk about you know the future of decentralized technology. So this is episode four hundred eighteen, and I'm here today with uh, Anatoly Yakovenko. He's the founder and CEO of Solana. Um, yeah, so welcome, Anatoly. Awesome to be here. Yeah, so we've we've done an episode before with you, right? So this was like two thousand nineteen, uh, pretty early on. You had uh, there was a blog post where you guys outlined sort of the seven. I think it was seven. Uh, you know, eight. Technical, eight was eight. But one got dropped. So. <laughs> Which one got dropped? Archivers. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it was basically like okay, these are like these uh, you know technological breakthrough or innovations that like Solana is based on. Of course, that was like early on, and now here we're today at the, the Solana conference breakpoint in Lisbon. Uh, it's been it's, uh, last day. Yeah. Last day. Yeah. So, yeah. How how is how's the conference been for you? It's great. Yeah. It was uh, really unexpected how many people were going to show up and how much energy they were going to bring. Uh, Lisbon is a wonderful city, so it's kind of easy to put on a good show here. It's mm. just a really nice place, but um, just really cool to see all the people that. You don't know if they're bots or not online, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, you know, there's, there's people, right? People that love to code, love to build stuff. Just yeah. amazing. Well, for you, what, what do you feel like makes the Solana community? What's it like? I think, yeah, it's this idea that we're ready to eat glass, I think, kind of started permeating okay. through this. And the, this yeah. goes back to, like, the validator days. When I was talking to you guys and like, you know, Certus and all the other ones, the the problem was that like, hey, we need you to go to a data center and put boxes up and everyone said that's too hard, <laughs> except for the for, for the few. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's definitely true, right? Because I guess... Um, so, I mean, of course, our listeners, right, will be well for, aware of Solana at this point, right, at least on a high level. Uh, you know, I think Solana is, I don't know, number five or six or something like that, or four, I'm not sure, but like somewhere, somewhere pretty high up. When yeah, it's like, I, don't, uh, I don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe let, let's just step back a little bit and sort of start at the beginning. Like, what was the original vision for you for Solana? So, I'm uh, like an operating system geek. I worked on Brew, I worked on Android and the Linux kernel. That's That was like the first interesting problem that I thought, this is cool in tech. Um, I don't know why I thought it was cool. It's kind of like a boring thing, right? You have hardware and you're just writing a little shim 
on top to abstract the hardware to make it easy for devs. But you're, there's so many constant trade-offs that you're dealing with that it's kind of a nerd snipe, right? It's a rabbit hole. <laughs> How do you build the fastest possible system call and things like that become kind of interesting challenges. So when I started Solana, you know, I called a bunch of my friends from Qualcomm. I was like, okay, this is a, a new operating system, a new platform. There's going to be applications. We don't know what they look like, but there's stuff running on Ethereum. We think that's like, it was super early days, uh, 2017, 2018, just there was an idea of a smart contracts, but mm. there were no NFTs yet. Wallets barely worked. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it was just this kind of, you know, let's build another OS, but now with a different set of challenges. Maybe talk a little bit about this idea of like Solana as an operating system. Like, Yeah, the, the thing that got me excited that I thought that I could make a, a difference was that um, I never thought sharding was a viable option. So again, I, I the reason the design is the way it is is because it's what I'm good at. <laughs> but I also think that it's the best design, all things considered. And the if you don't have sharding, you have one constrained environment. Like there's only one of these computers. Um, then you're dealing with effectively an embedded system. And that's where you have constrained hardware. And I'm good at finding those, you know, local minimums where you can squeeze the most performance out of, the, out of a fixed set of, you know, you know, memory, silicon, cores, whatever. So once you, once you constrain it to like, you only have this much, that's all you're going to get. How do you squeeze everything out? That's, that's kind of the, the problem that I'm good at. And that was to me kind of the challenge. So the design and everything else that followed really tried to uh, optimize for, let's build the fastest possible OS given the hardware as it is today and where it's going, which was and still is um, CUDA cores, single instruction, multiple data, these massively parallel you know, systems where you have, um, you know, kind of a constraint, like, you know, programming a GPU or AVX is different than ri writing a bunch of code that does whatever it wants. So you're, mm. you're already dealing with a little box, you know? <laughs> yeah. So how do, you, how do you make that little box the fundamental core part of the platform, the developer's target? Right, because like, I think that was, I remember you, you know, that was always where Solana was kind of unique, right? Where you had uh, all of the other projects, you know, from like Ethereum, Near, you know, and many others were all focused on, on somehow, okay, we have this one blockchain, now it's getting full, we got to like paralyze it or like, you know, we've got to yeah. shard it and then we have the system, that's how it scales, right? And you, you went the other way. I think still... So the, the reason for that was I looked at the data sheet of, you know, computers at the time and just Google on the internet, okay, what, how much, how, how fast can you do a signature verification? How much of those can you do on a GPU? How fast can you move memory mm -hmm. from the network card to the GPU to do these operations? And they just kind of like laid it out. And it looked like that with hardware, you know, in 2017, 2018, not super expensive hardware, just off the shelf stuff that you could find, you know, at, at Fry's or Amazon, you could get to, you could saturate one gigabit, which was roughly 700,000 TPS or 500,000 TPS if the messages are 256 bytes. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you build software that like gets out of the way of the hardware so you can actually take in that many messages? figure out where the signatures are, move all the data to the GPU, run all the signature verification, go fetch all the contract state, go figure out which programs you want to call, execute them, then dump the state transitions back into you know, whatever disk or storage. In theory, on the data sheet, you can do that. In practice, <laughs> it's really, really hard because um, the operating system you're running on, well, it has a scheduler and it decides when stuff goes. Uh, you have like caches that are not uniform. Um, you take a lock on one thing and it stalls like a thousand other things, and then it becomes that. That's that's the that kind of like 
meat and potatoes problem where you're just looking at Grafana metrics and benchmarks and heat maps. <laughs> yeah. That's that was my bread and butter for a decade. So that that's where I thought that I could have an edge. And so if you look at it today, what are the bottlenecks? It is like um, so. If you take a modern system, um, I think you guys ran some benchmarks, but uh, there's other validators like uh, and Buzzer and like a bunch of folks in the community that. It, they just spin up whatever the latest and greatest they can get. And on modern, like epics with, you know, I think 128 cores or plus, without going to GPUs, you can break 200,000 TPS in a single system. So that's just this runtime, fetch a transaction from a Linux kernel DGP buffer, do signature verification, go find some state, do a change in that state, and write it back. Mm. But all the states are parallelizable. They're, they never touch each other. So in the most kind of trivial, you know, flip one bit on chain, right? Yeah. <laughs> flip as many bits in parallel as you can atomically. Uh, you can scale it up without going to GPUs to about 200,000. And maybe with GPUs, maybe 250, um, because the bottleneck is no longer signature verification. It's um, memory, network cards, I.O. latency, you're dealing with um, very small packets, which is a huge pain in the butt. Um, hardware doesn't like small things. It likes, give me one giant chunk of stuff. So when we outlined those eight, pro eight solutions, it was really like eight, eight challenges. This, these are the mm. things that we think we need to solve, and this is how we think is the best, best bet to solve them. Um, and, you know, the one that we dropped was the kind of the least important one in a way. The replicators. Uh, it was storing the entire history of the ledger uh, because of uh, you saw Filecoin and Arweave and a bunch of other folks solve that problem. And you now have robust networks that can do persistent storage forever of, mm. of history. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, how far do you think this one can take this? Like, do you think Solana will be capable of like, you know, handling sort of yeah. all the L crypto blockchain activity that people want to create? Uh, like link line rate, which means that as fast as packets arrive to the network card, mm -hmm. before the next one arrives, you can already handle the full, the full loop. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's doable, honestly. I think it's scalable to whatever the bandwidth you can connect, right? So if you have enough, if the latest and greatest bandwidth is 20 gigabit, uh, you can go to FPGAs, go to hardware, like start doing this directly on the on the neck, on the, on the NIC. Um, I think it's doable, but that requires kind of a huge investment. And both in terms of financially, because you need to hire a bunch of engineers, you need to contract out with like, you know, the Foxcons of the world, you'll need to build the reference platform. That's like kind of going, yeah. The Solana signature box. <laughs> <laughs> so that means also like validators running like very different setups and very different hardware and it would be, yeah, this is kinda going to the what I think will probably be the eventual future of this stuff, if there is such a thing as a global price discovery engine. Like what is blockchain for? I think it's for running markets, right? And and tracking ownership. Mm. But tracking ownership is settlement, right? And settlement's part of running a market. So if you have one giant global, you know, state machine for running all of the world's markets for, you know, from NFTs inside Star Atlas to, you know, BTC, USDT or whatever the most liquid pair is, every every market in the world all on the same thing. Um, I f it really feels like it should be optimized to whatever the physics allow. Do you think there are there mechanisms that will, or like you know, what do you think will drive, you know, in, in a way, right, for this kind of progression to happen, right? Well, you would, what you would also want is that like the different validators, and people running validators, have like an economic incentive to do that, right? That they know in a way like, okay, if someone increases their capacity, like you know, they economically benefit from that. That is the the tragedy of commons problem. Right, I honestly think it's overstated. Just, just being here, right, at this conference and the people you meet, 
that's the vast super majority of the validators and they just want to like they want to see the whole thing succeed sure, <laughs> that the number of people taking advantage of the tragedy of commons problem in a open decentralized network in an open source community right it's like the people that you know complain about the linux bugs but never never try to fix them or never try to help the dev debug them it's a small number they just get they just get filtered out <laughs> it's like yeah. why why would you be doing this right there's there's plenty of other ways to make money like you're doing this because you have some passion something that is like okay we're going to decentralize the world <laughs> yeah sure i agree with that right but for still, now for but now still you will need to like put a lot of investment into that right to for sure um but it's not like too hard right it's just you know the opening ceremony I talked about decentralization the importance of the behavior change to maximize censorship resistance it's not a technology mm. problem it's a really like a community like needs to be aware that it's important yeah you mentioned a lot the idea of censorship resistance i'm curious like what kind of censorship are you most afraid of um it's actually not that I'm most afraid of. It's the one that I want that I feel like will provide the most benefit. So, like Bitcoin, right, is censorship resistant, but it doesn't guarantee when. Mm-hmm. And um, that is actually true about any system, <laughs> any BFT system, right? You send a message, Solana like goes into fork death because there's a denial of service and BGP routers get screwed up, and the network can't come to finality. Right? Um, is the network censorship resistant or is it being censored? Well, if in 24 hours the validators figure out how to reroute around that failure and continue right from the last point of finality and then your message gets accepted, then it got accepted just within 24 hours and not 400 milliseconds. <laughs> <laughs> so the network is, no matter what, censorship resistant as long as there's at least one validator that's out there with a valid copy of the ledger that they can tell everybody, hey, look, this is the right, this is the valid copy. You can all run your tools locally to verify it. Everybody sign this thing, right? So in that sense, if you don't put a time constraint on it, it's censorship resistant. But what people want for the benefit of actually using this stuff in practice is they want those guarantees within a very small amount of time because when I like click a button, you know, an audius that says I like the song, I don't want to wait 24 hours. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I don't want to pay an arbitrary amount. I don't want to pay an unknown amount of money to get that thing uh, accepted, right? I want to pay a very small amount of money and have that be confirmed in a very short wow. amount of time. So when you constrain that, then it becomes an embedded systems problem, which is but, uh, fun. I, I, yeah, I mean, of course, that definitely makes sense. Like, of, of course, yeah, you want to, I want to be able to send a transaction, I want it to be confirmed, like, you know, pretty much as fast as it can, uh, possible, cheap. You know, I think Solana actually does that today, does it well. Um, but that doesn't, but censorship is, I mean, I guess, what, what could censorship be, right? I mean, of course, you could have, like, maybe governments trying to kind of, like, crack down on blockchain networks and, like, so as long Maybe, as right? as long as there's one copy, right? Right. This is why when you look at like the validators app, uh, Brian and all these other folks, they're like, okay, well, what are the data centers? What are the ASNs? Let's map this out and let's track where stake weights concentrated, and then let's go talk to those people and get them to decentralize it more. And you see that process run in the community, and people are like, if given the information everybody's making like the right decision. They're like, okay, my nodes are all in Hetzner, let's move them out. All we had to do was just tell people, hey, look, there's too many nodes in Hetzner. Yeah. It's, it's a, it could like cause the network to stall, right, if Hetzner has a fire. Right. And people just did it on their so own. That, that, so I agree <laughs> with that, right? So of course, there's definitely like a risk, right, around like geographic concentration right. of nodes, or maybe if you have like a few validators that have like, you know, a very large amount of stake, and then like maybe there's some right. sort of, uh, although even there, right, you have today, I think like 19 validators, right, that are like the super minority. So, 
But like the censorship thing feels like a different so that is, question that, to me. So you know? to me, that it's the same question because you're kind of looking at the Nakamoto coefficient. Yeah. So you take some parameter, data centers or ASNs, and then you start uh, assigning, given whatever it is, data centers, ASNs, you know, um, geographic like you know jurisdictions. Where is the concentration of stake and node? Yeah. And then you identify that bottleneck that's above whatever threshold you don't like, 33% or 15 or 5%. And then you go talk to those people like, hey, look, this, this is like a worrisome thing. Can you guys move your nodes? And people will do it. That's the cool part. Um, but that, that, again, the reason why you want to do that is because that has impact on real-time censorship resistance. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to have this, like, guarantee that if, if I send a message and that's the thing that fails, right, the a Amazon ASN goes down, <laughs> yeah. that now I have to wait maybe 24 hours before that message is accepted. What I want is when I send a message within 400 milliseconds and for a fraction of a cent, it always gets accepted. I mean, to me, that feels like sort of around the resilience of the network, right, a lot. But it's the same thing, right? It's just, a, like, you start going to objectively measurable parameters. What is, what can we, what's objectively measurable? Like, yeah. any, any one of those things, you can then decide, this is what we're looking at. We think the failure rate is X. Then we need to go and make sure that there's at least, you know, Y number of uh, these things before the network has to go through this like recovery procedure. Mm. What do you think are the biggest challenges ahead for Solana? I mean, realistically, the going to like link line rates being unbounded by the software, right, by the implementation, it's, it's a really hard problem. Mm. It's like a really hard engineering problem. Um, so that that's kind of the biggest challenge. It seems like the Solana's fast, right? Right. Cheap and fast, but there's 300 million cryptocurrency holders out there. Mm. That's the latest number I saw. When we actually talked to the folks doing analysis of how many of those do stuff on all the chains combined, it's like maybe three, four million at most. Yeah. <laughs> actually, people, individual humans signing stuff, it's a very small number. There's a lot of like, you know, people arbing. Uh, Uniswap or whatever markets on Ethereum, but uh, those are mostly bots and it's not 10 million people, it's a very small number of people generating mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. half a million whatever events per day. So yeah, the, the real challenges are like the, the engineering ones. Everything else I feel like is the, is, is like the, 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 the every, if we do that right, like everyone else in the community will solve all the other problems. It's just that's the that's the challenge that you can't fix over a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dealing with uh, the fact that our developer tooling requires you to un by hand pack and unpack data structures. Developer can do you know figure out how to write a library for that over a span of a week or two, and Armani did right. Mm -hmm. So that's not a problem that we actually need to solve. The hard one is if it takes two years to design um, hardware that can actually handle unbounded bandwidth, like go up to 20 gigabits, and we really believe that that's what the world needs, right, for the world to be fully decentralized, then that's the thing that, uh, that's the biggest challenge that we need to tackle. Yeah. One thing I'm also curious about, because I feel like it's a, it's a topic that's like discussed a lot in some other kind of crypto communities, and I think it's like less so in Solana is like the topic of governance. And I'm curious, like, what do you, how do you think Solana governance should work? I mean, maybe today, but also in the long term. Yeah, like I think, um, I'm, I'm like a, I think it should have like a very clear, constrained mission that makes sense. And then the only thing that the governance is doing is, hey, are you executing on this mission or not? Like it's more just like a back back check on the on the work that's being done, and like uh, because if you have a like like it's almost like a con constitutional di di dictatorship or whatever, right? <laughs> 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 uh, 
you got to like you got to pick what you're going to do, right? And that's that's the thing that's the most important and then you invest in it over a long period of time and it's not open to question like whether you change the mission it's that are you like screwing up an execution or not mm. and making that big bet is the is the hard part and uh, the bet that everyone is making i think internally at labs the foundation and for the vast majority i think for basically everyone that i've ever talked to is that that real time censorship resistance piece that's an important thing mm. <laughs> and we should we should basically do whatever we can to maximize it okay uh, but then, like, let's say there are like different interpretations, different visions, yeah. differences that arise. Like, do you feel like so? So, like, inflation was a great example. Yeah. What is the optimum rate for inflation? Nobody knows, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and does it impact censorship resistance? Well, if you don't have it, it does. If you have too much of it, it does. But that's again like a very wide decision thing. Yeah. And. Within the community, there was a proposal process. Everybody that wanted to submitted a PR that mm. said it should be X. They tried to defend their reasoning for it. Uh, there were people that wanted to not have inflation at all. Mm. There was a forum post on this, and then there was a validator effectively vote, and that's where it got. Right. Mm. So that that kind of like, how do we pick a parameter? Right. Like that's that that feels like again like a thing that. You can ask the community and have it figure it out, mm -hmm. go through that process. But do you feel like there will be a need at some point for like a sort of a, a explicit on-chain governance system, or like you prefer that kind of thing to happen? Uh, well, I mean, validators are always an explicit on-chain governance. For them to take an upgrade, for them mm -hmm. to sign a feature up, a feature upgrade, right, mm -hmm. is a explicit thing. Uh, because they're signing those messages with their validator keys. <laughs> sure, that's true. Yeah. Now, of course, validators have that role with upgrades. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So, but like for a layer one, that is the layer where anything important with regards to governance happens. Is that mm. the validator stuff? Mm. I don't think you can escape it. Yeah, I don't. I don't think you can like push it up. I mean, it's interesting that Cosmos kind of did that, and there's like a pass through mechanism to the stakeholders. Yeah, you, you can, of course, you can never escape that, right? That's always there. I think that's true, right? I mean, I guess maybe Tezos was the one that were in, like, for this sort of trying to do that, right, with these automated upgrades, yeah. but still, right? Like, a validator can always fork the software and, yeah. like, run something different. So, to, um, me, to me, it always felt like that's the heartbeat, the validator yeah. community. Those are the people actually running it. They have the most understanding of the day-to-day. Mm. And that's almost like you gotta convince them to do anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you fail to convince them, you're doing something wrong, right? <laughs> Maybe you can talk a bit about. Uh, well, I'm curious about MEV. Like, what? So this has become like a big topic on Ethereum, I guess. Most importantly, where and maybe for listeners who are like not too familiar with it, basically it revolves around the ability of miners to like. To decide on the order of transactions, and then there's like economic value in that. Like for example, yeah. there's like an arbitrage opportunity, and then uh, someone can can uh, you know kind of so, do the arbitrage, make some money, and then of course like if you can decide like who who puts, which transaction does that, that there's value in that. So Solana's blockchain and Nasdaq speed, <laughs> and we never thought of MEV. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, so I always thought that, that that was actually the feature for for blockchain. This is how they should work. They should have MEV. Yeah. And if you come from that perspective, it means that you need to maximize the um, almost the market for it, like maximize the competition for MEV. Mm. Um, so how you do that is you reduce the block times to a smallest amount possible. So we're at 400 milliseconds and you have a leader scheduled four times in a row. So imagine it's 200 milliseconds and the, you have a switch in every block from one leader to the next. And Solana is actually designed where you can have more than one leader assigned to the same slot producing the same block. If you look at the white paper, I don't know if people okay. got it. There's this thing where you kind of mix the things and you can then tell the relative time of events. Um, 
It's a B minus white paper. I get it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but all the ideas are there. <laughs> so if you have multiple block producers now in that two hundred milliseconds, me as a trader, I'm willing to wait, you know, two seconds, and I want to maximize the number of bids that I see from the validators. The real time guarantees in Solana is that if I'm a validator and I'm assigned slot ten. That I'm guaranteed to be able to transmit a block in slot ten,、yeah. and as long as no more than a you know a third of the network is actively trying to censor me, then because of how Turbine works, because of proof of history's is force delay function, I'm have extremely high confidence I'll be able to actually submit this block and have it confirmed. So that means that I can then bid for this order to the user that's willing to wait until my block. Therefore, I can give him the highest rebate out of all the other validators, right? So at this like lowest layer, by minimizing the block time, maximizing how often we switch, maximizing how many block producers work on a single block together, right? right we can actually create the biggest, fairest, most competitive market for MEV. Okay. And, and then you then you have real value creation, right? Because what is what is MEV? It's actually I'm observing all of the world's information, every exchange out there, Twitter feeds, etc. I am creating a, a model for what the future price of anything is going to be, right?、Mm. So I am doing value creation, right? I'm predicting the future. Then I'm betting, you know, bidding for order flow. Hey users, I have the best model predictor. This is what I think the fairest price is going to be, right? By the time you submit your order. Give me your orders. I'll give you the biggest kickback. <laughs> yeah. So, so I I definitely agree with you, right? That like short block times. I mean, first of all, I guess MEV is obviously harder on Solana than on Ethereum, right? I think that that's already、yeah. in a, in a way. I think it has been、uh, reduced. I think、yeah. Solana has kind of reduced the scope of it and, and maybe the issue around it.、Uh, but but, but、yeah. it's it, it is value creation if you can、yeah. feed it back to the user. Yeah. Because you are effectively trying to predict the future, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, and and yeah, I think in, in a way you will see it feeding back to users, right? Because I mean, first of all, right, if validators、uh, make more money with that, then it's also something where they can, for example, say, oh, like you know, we、Let's、don't buy more hardware, right?、We、yeah, let's reduce fees. <laughs> exactly, reduce fees, right? Exactly,、yeah. right? Or maybe have any negative fees, you know. Which is what I mean by rebates, right? And、yeah. you can you can do it via like a global negative fee rate, right? If if you want to socialize it, or、mm. you can do it a competitive way. And I think the com- competition is actually a pretty good approach because, you know, like folks like Saskahana, like Jump, they have their own models, right? This is where they differentiate,、mm. and this is where they compete. And I think. You know, in a perfect world, they're the ones that are like running alongside. They they give validators some software. Hey, run our models, <laughs> <Yeah> . and <laughs> and,、uh, and and like send those prices to the users and and get you know everybody get everybody wins basically. And so, I mean, if you look at least sort of the debate around MEV and Ethereum, right? There's also different types of MEV that people think of differently. Like in particular, you know, like let's say this is the example of arbitrage. So you、yep. have like exchange A, exchange B, and the prices are different. And someone can make money by like bringing them、yep. in equilibrium. I think that's like unequivocally a good thing, right?、Yep. Because I, as a user, then can be basically say, I can just trade on whatever AMM. I don't have to worry about it because、yep. the prices、yep. should be the same, right? So that I think that's clearly a great thing. Then there are other things, you know, like the sandwich attacks, right? Which are Basically, right. I mean, how does it work, right? So let's say a user basically says, "Okay, I want to trade, you know, this amount of coin for this other amount of coin, and I'm willing to accept, you know, a price up to some amount, right? Where,、uh, and then somebody can basically push the price to that amount, take it back, and and sort of I get the worst possible price I was okay with. So who, right? So who takes a the loss there, right? The LPs or the user? The the trade like whoever makes the trade takes a loss. Right. right? So if you have at a, least on the first right, order, right? right, right.、Uh, so, so if you have a competition for user flow, then everyone's gonna say, well, I can maximize the sandwich attacks. Yeah. And I'll give you fifty percent of the profit, and I keep fifty, right? And some other 
validator says, well, we'll give you 75% and keep 25%. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the user wins, right? Well, I mean, if we can improve the stake system, right? right. I guess the, yeah, the, so the reaction could be, right, that, yeah, validators basically try to like maximize that in, so, in some way. Uh, and then that profit flows back to uh, the sole holders, right? The stakers in the end. Yeah. Well, um, and like, not entirely, right? Because you, to be able to maximize that, you would need to, I think, give a return to the users as well. There's you mean some, the person trading? Yeah, there's some equilibrium. Because Why do you the, think so? Because the user always have a, has a choice to trade on Solana or anywhere else. Yeah. There's no, there's never like a monopoly. There's no moats, right? So you're always going to be dealing with a user that has the option to make that trade in Phantom, right? Or they can actually go to FTX. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course, the other, I think sort of the other maybe answer to that might also be just that, well, you can, you can certainly design AMMs that are resistant to that, right, to different degrees, right? So I think to some extent, though, if people do that, then well, people will stop using that kind of AMM, right? That I, I think they're actually going to be slower and have worse spreads compared to a competitive MEV market. Okay. So the latencies are going to be worse because you're trying to like basically stop information from flowing as fast as possible. Mm. You're trying to control when tr when events happen and force an ordering or like randomize stuff, right? Um, and it's maybe perceived as more fair, but I think the result is uh, a slower kind of uh, a slower system that's going to be more expensive. Right. So your take is like okay, it should be exploited to the maximum. And then return to the user, right? To the to the stakeholders, whoever, right? <laughs> I'm just thinking, like practically. Yeah. Uh, I wonder how that actually flows back uh, to who? To the user. Well, like uh, what I imagine, and none of this works yet, is that at the wallet itself, right? You could have a button that says "Wait X sec X seconds to get Y re Y kickback for your trade." Yeah. Yeah. And maybe you always say fastest, right? Like there is like get fastest, cheapest, whatever, slowest gas meter yeah. and how much you pay, right? In this case, it's how much you want back. <laughs> right. So a wallet could basically say, okay, we are going to kind of like, you know, sell the transaction, yeah. right? And then uh, MEV is taken from that. And then some of that goes back to the, to the wallet and then they can distribute yeah. that to the users. To some extent. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting to see all of this. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. there's so many pieces there. It's such a, yeah, that is like a whole financial system just for trading pictures of, of dogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <that's right>. <laughs> <laughs> the entire world's financial system is going to sit on top of a collection of, a, of monkey NFTs. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that, in a way, is kind of the amazing thing, you know, about like what's kind of happening in crypto and is that like, you have these like speculative markets around yeah. everything and then people <laughs> like optimize things, you know, to to yeah, make it more efficient, make more money or something like that. And then I think it drives forward all of the technology along. Yeah. So this is where like, you know, if we do the really hard stuff, make this as close to physics as possible, then all this stuff becomes more efficient mm. and more value can be returned to the world. And this has kind of been my, my main focus and my biggest gripe with, um, this idea of ultrasound money is that that meme is not it is not maximizing the amount of value returned to the users it's not minimizing the value extraction like the these networks vitalik's idea was that this is a public good right right this is a public open to the world's like infrastructure it should be minimally extractive right mm. it should minimize the amount of value it takes so to be as close to the physics, the you know maximum capacity, cheapest cost. Yeah. And, and none, nothing else matters. No, no other memes. Doesn't matter if it's ultrasound, you know, money or not, or it's store of value. It's like, is it actually generating like a positive, not some good for the world, and is it taking the least amount of value to do so? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting, you know, how there has been, I think, a sort of 
shift in the Ethereum narrative where it was uh, Ether was thought of it was gas, right, in the beginning, right? It's just, okay, it's just to pay for transactions, right? And then I think there definitely has been a sort of shift towards this, even even this EIP-1559, right, with, like, burning the fees. Because people are willing to pay for that. Now, I think they've been doing it for so long that maybe the mindset has shifted, that it's acceptable. Like, in my mind, as an engineer, I'm like, no, this is wrong. <laughs> the system is wrong. <laughs> we yeah. got to, like, throw it all away if that's what it's going to end up. <laughs> I mean, I think today, right, Ethereum is just unusable, right? I mean, this is it's crazy that you have, like, hundreds of dollars of... Yeah. You, you have to pay for a transaction, right? So that's... It actually becomes kind of what... Bitcoin, actually, even Bitcoin's cheaper now, right? Yeah. Bitcoin can send <laughs> can send pretty easily now, but I think always uh, one of the ways that uh, you know, Bitcoiners were sort of dealing with, okay, the system's really not scaling, and it's clearly not going to scale unless like you you radically change something. Was like, okay, but then it becomes this kind of settlement layer, and Bitcoin transactions can be very expensive, and you have like layer two and things, and everyone can kind of hold Bitcoin even if they don't directly do so. And, and now I feel like store Ethereum. value is like at least some something you can look at and be like, okay, I don't really care about how long it takes for my transaction to settle. Yeah. Right. As long as within some like two weeks it does. Right. So within two weeks I could find a cheap enough time to do so. <laughs> so, so what are your thoughts on like rollups and the the kind of Ethereum scaling direction? Um, they're not as uh, they don't so they don't optimize the censorship resistance piece. Right, they actually just reduce. They batch stuff, so there's some batching optimizations. Mm. Uh, so they may reduce some costs to users, but the majority of those costs are simply because EVM is too inefficient to execute. Mm. Right, so you, if you get rid of EVM execution, that's what effectively a rollup does. Right, is it delays executing EVM until um, like you need to run a fraud proof. Mm. Um, but if you don't use EVM, you use like BPF, x86, any other like efficient virtual machine. Um, it's not a, there's no real savings there. So you say it doesn't reduce censorship resistance because, or okay. it doesn't maximize for censorship resistance because... Um, it like, only optimizes this one thing that's extremely slow that yeah. you don't need to do anyways. And uh, if you, Let's say you reduce fees to users, but you still have the settlement layer that's extremely expensive to use. Mm. So that thing, let's say that thing is generating eighty million dollars a day in revenue. Mm. Is that is it providing censorship resistant decentralization at the cost of eighty million dollars a day? No, it's not. If you look add up all the costs of running an Ethereum node and add up all the nodes and how it's sliced, right, in terms of uh, censorship resistance, like real time. It's, uh, I think, like 4,000x off. <laughs> you mean that the, the, the fees collected, right, by. are much higher than the, the cost to run so. Right. So it is not a minimally extractive public good, right? Mm -hmm. It is a thing that is, has like captive markets for the services it's providing, and it's actually kind of like squeezing. Yeah. And right. It, you could, you know, reduce some of those costs to users, and even if you, you can, that allows you to increase the number of users that will use the system. Mm. But it's still not a efficient system for the value it's creating for the world. Yeah. No, I, I think that's true, right. right? I think there's obviously, like, is an extent where, you, okay, you have this Ethereum ecosystem, and there's a lot of interoperability, a lot of things there, so there's a lot of, like, value to, like, being in that ecosystem. And then... But at the moment, it's sort of like, okay, because there's this capacity constraint, right? And just kind of everything, right? It, it, it attracts, extracts the what it can <laughs> to the Ethereum. The value is in the cryptography. Yeah. And it's in the hands of the users. And a user that is holding a BAT token that now holds it from a sec P256 K1 key in MetaMask and a ET255 19 key in Phantom for the same token, mm. they're still part of that bat community that likes Brave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that just, you know, got uh, 
that token went through wormhole, right? Yeah. There's some risk there to use a, a bridge always, but uh, you can analyze that risk, you can minimize it, and now you've reduced significantly reduced fees, and now you can kind of minimizing the amount of value that the network itself extracts from that community. Do you think it's essential, or do you think? Yeah, I, I wonder to what extent is it just is just a crucial thing that you sort of stay ahead that sort of the the network you know throughput or the capacity of the network stays uh, ahead of the actual load by like a, yeah. a big enough factor. Yeah, because you're like kind of like uh, costs go up when there's like a burst. Mm. Really, like most things, like what any kind of web scale system you're paying usually for the worst case because mm. you have like a rush right and you don't want to be able to handle it so just like in those systems you're typically going to have to have be way over capacity to handle a extremely high spike mm. and when you get that spike persistently that's when fees need to go up to force whatever is effectively spamming the network to back off yeah well, let's talk a bit about sort of, you know, we are still at, you, you were saying before, right? I think, okay, you were saying maybe 300 million accounts, crypto accounts, no, like to, 4 million holders, users. Total yeah, holders, total holders, right? Holders. So like pets.com stock holders, yeah. 300 million actual <laughs> users of pets.com, you know, Twelve. three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so where do you think we are in terms of like mainstream adoption? Do you think we are going to see the kind of like, Web two applications, uh, yeah. On like, what time frame do you think those are? It, if if next year we were looking at like Phantom adding a million users a month, um, that would feel like it seems real, right? That would that seems mm. possible. Yeah. Even a million a week, it's like seems possible. But that would be like, oh man, we're this is it. <laughs> <laughs> We've, we've, we've hit real-world adoption. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's kind of like, I don't know when that happens. Could be next year, it could be two, three years from now. It's hard to say, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, next year feels just as likely as two years or three years. Yeah. I mean, probably a lot depends on the market, right? Because if, yeah. if things go up, then interest just goes up so much. I, I guess it's two things, maybe, right? Like, I think the crypto market is like a huge factor. Where yeah. It just drives so much interest. And then maybe another thing is like, okay, people are actually putting out applications that are just really great and they're unique because they leverage crypto. And then people just want to use the application. They don't care about yeah. the market and the prices. And then they kind of switch that way. So what we see now, I guess it's different in the in this cycle is that you're not investing in ideas or white papers, it's in, in like actual products. Mm -hmm. You almost don't even, I haven't read any white papers a lot in like the last six months. It's like, give me the MVP that works and I kind of look at it, the design, the UX, and sure there's like some innovation around the risk engine or the, the thing that the, you know, the new fancy DeFi market <laughs> or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I almost don't care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that part is like not as important as this. There's like good UX, and if it feels like humans are going to use it. <laughs> yeah. So the the thing that makes me sort of like pause a little bit here is because I remember you know in 2013 there was this bull market, and then we had 2017, 18 this bull market, and personally like in each of those past bull markets. I was pretty convinced that that's, like that's it's one. it. There's <laughs> like mainstream adoptions coming, right? Because it's obvious that this is like but, gonna be superior in so many ways and that like oh people understand that they're like adopt it and why would that ever stop, right? Like why would it stop until it's actually like there? And then of course it kind of did in both times. So I'm I'm wondering, is it is it the same now? Is it also like okay, we have we in this bubble have this idea because it's obviously in the end it's going to happen, right? Yeah. In the end, you know, it's all going to be on crypto and like... So you don't think like, this is we, the one? I, I don't know. <laughs> you think it's the one? Yeah. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And yeah, it's kind of scary. <laughs> so you think that it's, it's like full... It's not going to like be easy because yeah. you still need to build applications. 
you need to like iterate on the parts where you see drop off that users like lose interest. Yeah. Right, and you need to build really good applications that people want to use that have some some true like reason to be cryptographic, right? To have cryptography. Yeah. Not just like we stuck crypto inside, you know, Facebook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it has to like actually have meaningful reason, right? Um, and that's that's when I think we start seeing it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think if you think uh, if you look at you know what happened in these past bear markets, right? You had you had a big crash in price. And you also had the crash in, I mean, one was like confidence in the thing, right? There was uh, yeah. many people who were like, we think this is going to happen. And it was like, oh, I guess it's not going to happen after all. Yeah. So I think there was that. And then I think there was also like a decrease in activity, right? Because like funding dried up yeah. and activity dried up and a bunch of people went elsewhere. A lot and of funds just died. Yeah, a lot of funds, companies died, right? <laughs> so I guess... I mean, obviously the volatility is here and, and it's here to stay at least for a while, right? So I think we, we are going to see the big crashes. But I guess the question is, does that actually slow down anything? Or is it still going to be that like in terms of, you know, people building applications and usage? Because and, right now there's so much capital here, right? So there was like a run, right, from 93 till 2001 on the internet. Yeah. And this is where I think we'll, this is the one. It's going to be eight years of craziness. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then right exuberance and then... So where do you think we are on this 93 to 2000? Well, if it's, three, if it's three million users, then it's like 93, 94. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is wild. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I don't know. Anything else we can talk about? I think a lot of your listeners went through the bear market. And we're yeah. building with us in the trenches. Um, I think that's what actually will get you, will, will cause the, the super cycle. Yeah. Is the, is the people building that have been through the other ones that are like, okay, well, this is fun, right? I'm actually seeing traction. I'm not yeah, going to stop. Yeah. And... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's the other thing, right? If you think back to 2017, 18, right? There's the, all of this exuberance and there was a lot of things you were like, is it like too much exuberance yeah. and stuff like that? And now there's there's definitely similarities, right? You can definitely see a lot of that stuff too. But at the same time, right? If you think of like the that that transition to go from like three million users to like three billion users, well, there is going to be that exuberance, right? Like that is just going right. to be part of it. It doesn't mean it's like a bubble that's going to end. It's only a right? thousand x. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually, it's not a lot. It's, yeah. <laughs> if you look at how fast smartphones uh, like grew from nothing to billions of users, it took mm. about a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, a, like baby two. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Anatoly. It was uh, yeah, you know, great catching up. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to like continue on this like Likewise. journey with crypto and, and Solana in particular. Likewise, yeah. man. Cool. All right. Thanks so much.